Hello to you and welcome to the CPO Strategy Podcast, the place to be to scratch that procurement itch. I'm Sean Gallia Patch, and today I'm joined by Simon Watson, Vice President of Visio Consulting. Today we'll talk about the changing procurement landscape and how leadership styles are evolving to keep up with the pace of technology. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the CPO Strategy Podcast. Hi, Simon, and, and welcome to the CPO Strategy Podcast. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, you know, as an executive with such a, a considerable experience in the space, I was kind of keen to find out a little bit more about your background and sort of how you ended up in procurement to begin with. So what made it the industry for you, do you think? Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Sean. It's it's great to, to be here and, and to talk to you. Um, so I think that, you know, the one word answer as to how I came into procurement was just accidental. Um, I think a lot of people have that answer. I mean, in terms of my background, um, I studied maths at, at university with a with a year abroad um, in, in France, uh, where I kind of got my languages um, up to a decent standard. And then after that, I was looking to apply for various different roles and, and jobs. I, I applied to a lot of roles in the, in the civil service at the time, which is what a lot of my friends were doing at university. Um, I didn't have a huge amount of success there. Um, I was also applying to some of the graduate programs that some of the you know bigger corporate firms were uh, were running, um, and uh, again didn't have a huge amount of success there either. But actually, one of the companies um, where I didn't quite make it onto the program, they did um, come to me afterwards and say, "Well, actually, uh, although you know we we don't think you'd be a great fit for the for the graduate program, we've got." A role in the supply chain team, um, and and we think you know your skill set is is better matched there. Um, so after quite a few rejections, it was quite nice to have an offer, um, and so I kind of jumped at the chance really um, and joined a. Uh, it's a big uh, plumbing and heating merchants uh, based in the UK, but it had global operations, um, and I worked in that supply chain team for kind of two and a half years. Um, uh, and although it was called supply chain, a lot of the work I was doing was was procurement, negotiating with suppliers. Um, and uh, that's kind of really how I learned about procurement and, and went into it. Um, and then it was after that stint there that I discovered um, consulting, um, joined a, a kind of boutique procurement consultancy, um, and I'm on to my third consultancy now. I've um, uh, been at this one for eight years, extremely happy. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in terms of why I have stayed in procurement, I think what I've learned over the years about one of the success factors in, in procurement is is being able to work cross-functionally. Um, you know, procurement doesn't own any of the spend really that it is um, responsible for helping to optimize. Um, and so it has to work with other functions and the spend owners. Um, and I quite like the people side mm. of, of that. Um, you know, the, the sort of building relationships, almost kind of selling internally, um, bringing teams together. Um, that sort of really appeals to me. And I've, I've been very happy in procurement ever since. And, you know, you would have seen so much sort of change over the last few years in, in procurement. You know, there's so many challenges and complexities these days. You know, just think of the COVID situation that we've gone through, you know, now the war in Ukraine, inflation, those sort of things. How would you describe those sort of challenges? And how do you think CPOs are sort of combating those issues today? Yeah, look, I mean, I would flip it around and say that th th these are not so much challenges, uh, rather opportunities for procurement. I mean, when I started, you know, my career sort of 18 or so years ago, um, you know, procurement was often fighting to get a voice. There were often complaints that, you know, procurement was not represented at the top table. Um, you know, what procurement was trying to push was not always on the, the radar of the C-suite. Um, but, the, you know, the things you've just mentioned there, Sean, you know, the war in Ukraine, inflation, COVID, um, you could add ESG to the mix there as well. You know, these are things which are on the C-suite agenda, front and centre. Um, and procurement is ideally positioned uh, to to help companies um, to, 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 you know, to, to face those challenges. Um, you know, a lot of if you think about, you know, COVID and, and the war in Ukraine, that, that's all impacting the supply chain. Um, which procurement is ideally positioned to 
uh, to help with. Uh, if you look at inflation, you know, that's supplier, you know, price increases coming through. How do you deal with that? Again, it's 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 working with suppliers and the business. Um, and then with ESG, you know, a lot of a lot of companies uh, depends a bit on the industry, but a lot of companies there their biggest sort of ESG footprint is in their supply chain. Um, and so procurement is in a privileged position, really. And I think it's it's done a lot to catapult um, the opportunity of procurement. Um, it's interesting. I spoke to a CPO about a year or two ago, um, and he was saying that, you know, he'd been trying to get time with the CEO for a couple of years, and he'd now met him three times in the last two months. Really? Yeah, <laughs> just, just, be- just because of these, these issues that are now on the C-suite agenda and, and radar. Do you think that they've sort of propelled CPOs have been propelled into sort of a more of a um, active role, essentially, um, you know, it's kind of a seat at the top table now? I think it has for those that have been um, sort of wise enough to seize the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I see I see some procurement functions that prefer to do what they've always done, um, you know, which is kind of focus a bit more on process um and uh you know more of a kind of transactional side of things but there are there are also many um forward thinking cpos uh you know procurement professionals out there um and they really have you know seized this opportunity to to be on the c suite agenda um and drive the thinking uh, and the solutioning to some of these big challenges that we're seeing lovely and obviously all the new technology in procurement you know has been around for more than a decade now digitalization has become such a an important topic these days, hasn't it? How would you sum up today where procurement and the supply chain is in the, in a digital transformation? Yeah, I think, you know, if I'm being honest, I would say it's a bit laggard. Um, and I don't mean that to sound overcritical. Um, you know, digital transformation is very difficult. And I think we have to recognise as well that there are some real trailblazers out there. There are some firms doing some fantastic things in digital. They've, they've you know, they've used and leveraged technology along with, um, you know, people uh, to really kind of produce better outcomes. But I think if you if you kind of contrast, let's say, you know, your experience <clears throat> as an individual when you're buying something, you know, in your private life, um, it's it's really very easy these days, uh, much easier than it was 20 years ago. Um, you know, you can you can get access to a wealth of pre-sourced things, whatever you might be buying, whether it's uh, whether it's food, whether it's a holiday, whether it's whether it's a car, whether whether it's any book, um, you know, you can see reviews of what other people uh, think of these things. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a much easier, uh, a more kind of streamlined process to buy something in your in your personal life than it was um, a couple of decades ago. Um, but you know, when you go into your workplace as a business user and you want to buy something, um, it doesn't quite work like that yet. Um, you know, you often have to fill in um, a form, um, you know, you have to send it off, you know, to a, to a procurement function, you have to wait for them to come back to you. Um, you know, they might come back uh, a little bit later than you were hoping, they might tell you that actually they don't have that um, part on the supply framework, so they're going to have to go and run, a, run an event. Um, and, you know, I think people sometimes get confused about how it can be so easy to buy something as large as a, you know, a car or a holiday on their sofa at home um, but when they want to buy something just a widget at work it seems to be quite cumbersome and you know I think digital can help a lot with that and will help a lot with that going forwards um, but it but it is incumbent on organizations and procurement functions in particular to figure out how how to kind of recreate that sort of customer experience um, that we've become accustomed to in our in our private lives so you know, there has been a lot of talk about digital uh, in the last few years, uh, and rightly so. It is the future. Um, but I think it's, you know, the corporate world still has a bit of catching up to do, uh, you know, when we contrast that with what we do in our, our private lives. With a new generation of leaders growing up with technology, um, how would you say that they're coping with the digital transformation? Um, and do you think that's really a, a key business enabler for um, them coming through to the fore? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I, I agree with your, your, the point which I think you're making, which is that, you know, we've got a, a new generation coming through now that have grown up um, used to a lot more technology. And I do think that will act as a catalyst uh, or one of the catalysts for further transformation, digital transformation in organisations. Um, and I actually think it will have to. 
Um, because I think if, if procurement does not manage to kind of recreate a little bit more that, that customer experience that the new generation expect, then I, I don't expect that they will want to use procurement going forwards and they will bypass procurement. Um, you know, the analogy that I've sometimes used uh, in, in this case is one of travel agents. Um, you know, I remember growing up as a kid kind of 25 years ago now, um, and I was lucky enough, you know, my parents uh, uh, were able to, you know, uh, take us on holiday once or twice a year. And I remember the process of going to uh, book a holiday. We, you know, we'd walk into the town centre to the travel agent. Um, you know, we'd, we'd have a look at some of the brochures there. Um, we'd then ask the travel agent a few questions. They, you know, they often then had to phone the various, I don't know, airlines or resorts on our behalf. Um, you know, they, they might not be able to get through, so we'd kind of have to come back the next day. Um, we then, you know, have a few decisions to make. And, you know, I remember as a kid being quite excited by the whole process, but actually thinking back, it was quite cumbersome. Um, you compare that to where we are now um, with, you know, being able to review everything online more or less um you know you can you can get instant answers to your questions in terms of availability in terms of pricing in terms of options um and you know it's, it's not a coincidence that the travel agents don't really exist anymore mm. um you know you will find one or two but they tend to be catering for a very specific type of individual or a very specific type of trip but in in general travel agents you know have disappeared largely from our high streets. And that's because people don't need to go to them anymore. Mm. Um, and I think procurement, you know, can learn a few lessons there um, because, you know, if it doesn't manage to give its internal customers uh, what it wants in terms of an experience, um, then, you know, there, there will be uh, other companies that come in and just go over the heads of procurement to offer business users, users what they want. So things like pre-source deals, there are already companies that, you know, pre-source deals and go directly to business users um, to be able to then go and choose what they want. And so I think it is, you know, it, it, I, I, I certainly hope and I expect it will act as a catalyst, this kind of changing expectation that the, the younger generation has about, you know, the experience they should have when they're buying something in, in the workplace. Lovely. Um, and, you know, it, it's a key driver, isn't it, technology in, in terms of, you know, business strategy um, and sort of creating value. Um, how much how much different is it today than what it was 10 years ago just how sort of how much value does it now create and the opportunities that it sort of enables what is it like in comparison today in 2023 than what it was like in 2013 for example um i think you know clearly technology keeps developing um we have some incredible technologies available at the moment and you'll often heard the you'll you'll often hear the terms like ai blockchain uh you know banded around and i think applied in the right way these are um demonstrating huge huge uh benefits i mean if you think just something like you know a, just as an example ai um you know there are there are certain systems that can interact with business users um you know through through ai to help them to serve their procurement needs and you know deployed in the right way that saves huge um, time and, and and brings great efficiencies and you know that's something that wasn't really fully developed uh, you know a decade ago or so you know the timeline you mentioned there but I also think when we have this discussion we shouldn't get too carried away about the technology itself um, and the reason I say that is because actually a lot of the technology which can make a huge difference today was around 20 even 25 years ago mm. um, you know uh, if you if you think about uh, some of the, the key challenges that, that the procurement function has, um, one of the biggest challenges that we see that the procurement function has, especially in global organizations, is that they're often having to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, you think about it, you have uh, different business units or different geographies. Um, often they're sourcing similar things. And if they're not, uh, if they're not, finding a way to capture the knowledge of what they're doing, um, they often end up duplicating on a huge scale. Um, and what that takes is, a, is, is an approach to capture and curate knowledge and information, which does need technology, but it doesn't need complicated technology. Yeah, this, this technology kind of, you know, your 
uh, sort of online collaboration sharing uh, portals have been around for a long time, um, at least 20 years. Um, and so I think whilst technology is developing at pace, I think we need to divorce that from, uh, you know, that's not the bottleneck as to why procurement has not yet fully exploited um, digital and, and technology. You know, the, the, the bottleneck is more around um, companies' abilities to marry up the available technology with the skills of their people um, and, and, and make sure they've got, you know, good fit for purpose processes. Um, and maybe we can talk about that in a bit more detail, but that that's where I would sort of focus a little bit more, um, you know, the discussion rather than the, the actual uh, development of technology. Mm. And obviously, you know, companies don't want to embrace technology for technology's sake, you know, they it has to have a purpose. Otherwise, what's the point? Where would you stand on um, using technology, but only using technology that actually has a value in, and can serve a purpose? Because, you know, if if it's not going to, in, you know, improve anything that's already in place, then you're just doing it for the sake of it. And what's the value in that, right? Yeah, I think with that, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, interestingly, I think you said there that you know, there's no point in implementing technology for technology's sake. Um, we did a study uh, of, of, of uh, many uh, sort of procurement leaders and, and CPOs uh, a few years ago. Um, and one of the things that we found in that study was that um, about 50% of procurement leaders admitted to having bought technology just on the basis of a fear of missing out, just kind of FOMO syndrome. Um, without any kind of real understanding of the benefits that that technology was going to bring. And that was really quite a, a shocking and revealing finding, we thought, because, you know, technology is not cheap. Um, you know, the implementation of technology is quite disruptive. Um, and if you're, if you're purchasing a system because you've got this, you know, feeling that everybody else is doing it and, you know, you need to keep up, um, then, you know, there could be some pretty costly uh, mistakes there. Um, and so it is really important to make sure that uh, when buying technology um, and when investing in technology, um, it's it's because the benefits um, are fully understood. And in fact, you know, just to go a bit further on this, um, you know, m my, my advice to, to companies has, has often been sort of three things, you know, when, when looking to digitalize, depending a bit where, where you are on your journey. Um, but three things, firstly, to own your data. Um, is, is, is number one. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Second one is to visualize that data. Um, and the third one, touching upon the point I made earlier, is around managing your knowledge. Um, and so this, you know, if you can sort of have it with that focus and that kind of sequencing and making your technology decisions off the back of that, then that's a much better way of thinking about it rather than just kind of jumping in and, and buying um, buying a piece of technology. Um, so just just in terms of just expanding that a bit, owning your data. I mean, one of the, you know, most of the problems in procurement come from a, a lack of transparency on data. Um, that's one of the reasons procurement is traditionally very reactive. You know, contract renewals um, come up, uh, you know, at the last minute. Uh, you know, we've lost our leverage with the supplier. Um, you know, making sure that our teams are working on the right initiatives, you know, which initiatives are actually going to deliver the most value, who is actually working on what, um, how are suppliers performing, you know, do we understand the risk and the performance of our of our suppliers? Um, you know, unless we've got data on this, it's very difficult for procurement to get on the front foot and be strategic. Um, so one of the things that, you know, companies can do there is, is just own the data. So things like creating a, you know, a common taxonomy running through the procurement process so that you've got um, you know your spend with the same taxonomy as your as your suppliers with the same taxonomy for example as your as your contracts and what your people are working on um, then if you've got that you can invest in a tool to help you to make some of those processes a bit more efficient um, in terms of visualizing data again you know if I was going to define the term digital procurement I think for me it's really putting data and insight into the hands of decision makers in the business mm. um, and the best way to do that is to to give it in a way that they can digest it understand it and make those decisions and i think if you can visualize data in all the various you know there's, there's many different visualization softwares out there that you can choose from um, and we you know we see a lot of clients using them um, if you can understand what data your your internal 
you know, customers need to make those decisions and then give it to them in a digestible format, that's when you're really making progress with a digital transformation. Um, and then finally, you know, I won't repeat it, but just managing your knowledge, we talked a little bit about it. Um, a big issue for procurement is reinvention of the wheel. So having a way to curate and, and reuse knowledge is, is really critical. Lovely. Thank you for that. Um, and now touching on sustainability, um, how can procurement help businesses turn their ESG strategies into reality? You know, there's a lot of discussion about sustainability and you know, ESG in that. Um, but in what ways can the procurement function help the ESG score of the company? Well, again, it's one of those areas where procurement is is, is ideally positioned, you know, if you think most of the, and I think in, in you know, in some industries, it's sort of 80 to 90%. If you, if we just take, let's say carbon emissions as one element of ESG, right. Um, but, you know, 80 to 90% of your, your carbon footprint could be in the supply chain. So clearly procurement has a role to play. I think the first thing to answer your question directly, the first thing procurement um, should do is to have some targets. Um, uh, and these targets need to be you know, they need to be measurable, they need to be realistic. Um, we did a piece of research a bit more recently around this, um, and we found that about 75% of organizations have targets on this, um, but that means that 25% uh, do not. Um, so there's definitely room there for more organizations to set targets on, you know, what is it they want to achieve in ESG, um, and, and concrete, concretely, what do they want to achieve? So, you know, again, this kind of being measurable and, and realistic. Um, but just as an interesting kind of side there, uh, a, a bit of uh, the research also um, showed that about only 40% are confident of delivering against their targets. Um, and actually 33% uh, actually didn't see any risk of, of not delivering against targets. So I think setting the targets is one thing. But beneath that, there needs to be some conviction behind there. Um, there needs to be some more confidence in delivering those targets. Uh, so those targets need to be realistic. Um, and I think people need to feel that those targets are credible um, and motivating. And if, you know, if, if a third of, of respondents to our particular survey didn't see a risk of not delivering, then um, that's a bit of a worry. Um, I think the other thing that procurement can do is to really step up and own um, this area. Uh, interestingly, only about 50% of the procurement leaders we spoke to saw ESG as being part of their remit. Um, and I can sort of understand that really, because, you know, this is a this is a corporate uh, uh, sort of priority. Um, it's not something that's necessarily come from procurement. Um, but, you know, there is that space there for procurement to go and grab it um, if it wants to. Um, and I think it you know, it will, it, it needs those forward thinking, confident CPOs to really kind of go and grab this and, and come to the business with solutions. And I think the sort of solutions that it can come with are helping a business to understand um, how the whole kind of ESG requirement fits from a commercial and cost perspective. Because I think as much as we like to think that there's lots of altruism in the world and companies do this because they're just being good, whilst those companies do exist, you know, a lot of companies, you know, they're accountable to shareholders, they, they're there to make money and, and make a profit. And I think, you know, procurement can really help to show how good ESG performing businesses can be better performing also commercially. Um, and, and that probably is the biggest thing that a, that a procurement function can, can do. Um, you know, because it builds, it's much easier to build consensus around that, I think, in, internally. And there's a big drive for it now as well, isn't there? In, in There's a real sort of want to, to do good, um, which perhaps, you know, wasn't necessarily there. Maybe not, maybe it was but um, previously, but there seems to be a real a big drive and that people want to, um, if they can be sustainable or, or make better choices, they, they want to now, don't they? They do. Uh, and that's exactly what that's my, exactly my point. I think, you know, procurement can help them to make that case. You know, it's not always a trade off cost versus ESG. You know, sometimes, you know, if you if you if you if you define it rather as value, you know, then an organization may be able to get into new markets. It may be able to increase revenue if it has better ESG credentials. Um, and that might mean spending a bit more with your supply base or investing more in your your suppliers to um, enable them to, you know, be be more sort of ESG friendly, if you like. Um, but, uh, you know, procurement is is ideally placed to help companies to understand that 
that sort of trade-off and, and understand that business case. Brilliant. And for the future of procurement, digital procurement, you know, it's an exciting, challenging place to be. I think you've already mentioned, you know, the opportunities um, that are there for companies. Um, but in the next sort of 12 months, 18 months, what 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 does that future look like in terms of the digital conversation and how companies push that forward? Yeah, I think looking forwards, I think one thing that procurement needs needs to do and continue to do is is will probably do more than it has done in the past is attract the really best people um i mean you know people at the end of the day are are what makes success and it's what makes a function successful it was what makes a, a company successful and i think you know procurement has often i think um not looked for the right skills uh, in, in in people that it employs i think traditionally it's looked for people with um you know procurement experience quite frankly and whilst you know people with procurement experience are um are, are of course valuable and, and required i think we also need people who um have leadership uh potential uh people who uh maybe think a bit more outside the box and not so process driven um, a lot of what procurement has done in, in previous years has been kind of process driven and if you're just limiting your search of people to uh, those that have had procurement experience, you're inevitably going to end up with a lot of people who are process driven. So I think expand being a bit bolder, uh, recruiting people from different backgrounds, kind of different skill sets. Um, I think as well, the if procurement can step up and own the ESG space, I think that will also help with the younger generation seeing procurement as a place to really make a difference in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe a career path that they had not considered, you know, before. Uh, so I think, you know, that's that that that's one thing that I think will be key to the success going forwards. Um, I think the other thing, just kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, um, you know, procurement really needs to try and capitalize on this new focus um, that it that it's been gifted um, by these macro events, you know, from the C-suite, um, making sure that they're seizing the opportunity to, you know, get on the top table, um, be seen as peers um, by by you know, by, by the business um, in helping them to address some of these key challenges. And then of course, you know, with technology, I think that was, you know, the main thrust of your question, um, that will continue to develop um, uh, and, you know, which, which is fantastic. But, uh, but as I've said before, I think that's not the bottleneck. I think procurement needs to really uh, take care to understand and own its data um and and curate its knowledge and i think that's how it will make um the biggest difference in the next you know the next period lovely um well thank you very much for joining us today simon um it's been a pleasure to have you on the cpo strategy podcast pleasure thank you sean 